good, good talk and very like straightforward. Thank you. Okay. One more thing. When someone asks a question, please repeat, repeat it. The question. Sure. Um, okay, we'll go ahead and start getting started. My name is Vincent Batts. I have been with Red Hat now for about six years, but I've been in the open source community for a while. Um, Red Hat is the first job that I have ever been paid for to be involved in the open source community, which is both exciting and has its benefits and drawbacks. Today we're going to be talking a bit about the world of Golang. Um, so when, before I came to Red Hat, I was at a company called uh, So before I came to Red Hat, I was at a company called Akamai that does uh, CDN logic and runs servers on the edge or edge or, uh, of the internet, and they deploy in a very container-esque fashion, uh, but one of the big tenets of their deployment was static binaries. Everything had to be static all the way to the floor. Uh, so it was not uncommon to see on any given host um, a, a Perl script that was, you know, 50K, and it would bring the whole stack with it. The Perl, the Perl version it was built with, 510, whatever, um, all the way through OpenSSL, Pickery, everything else. Everything had to be static, no matter what your language was. Um, so while I was there, Golang was very much in its infancy, like um, started in 2009, was just doing weeklies. Uh, we were already starting to use it, though, because the binaries, Go was a compiled language and static binaries. Um, when I came to Red Hat, through all my other jobs, that has been like one of the core things that has stuck with me at Red Hat. For a while, I was... Um, doing the packaging of it uh, for Fedora, CentOS, and RHEL. Um, inter uh, entertaining usage of it in the IT department. Uh, when I moved into the OpenShift team, uh, not only helping customers deploying with Go, but also um, looking at using it internally. Then Docker came along, uh, got involved in that project. That blew up into a whole different piece of history. Um, and so on and so forth. Like, Go has been a consistent thing through all my different functions here at Red Hat. Uh, so in today, we're going to talk a bit about what is the current state of Go. <laughs> uh, 
Um, this is kind of a fun website, Ashley McNamara from Microsoft. She's, been, she's a great illustrator and otherwise, but she ended up putting up a website called goforize.me, uh, and you can go customize your own Go, Gopher avatar. Uh, so I gave it a shot for myself. Um, you can hardly see my fuzzy hair underneath there. Uh, are we gonna keep doing this the whole? Somebody else? Um, Have you had anybody else, have you had this happen before? Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. No. Okay. Let's, let's continue with this one. Um, so let's see what I'm looking at. Well, this is not going to be any fun without any slides. <laughs> Let's see if I'll. Just a moment. All right, so let's try mirrored, if that's going to help at all. Probably won't. We'll figure it out. So go, if, if you're not familiar with it, and then this is, this is not going to be a very technical talk in that we're going to actually have like code examples and things that you like and dislike about the language. Um, the biggest things that I'm, I'm going to talk through here are kind of the status of where the community is, uh, things that have been added, things that have gotten better about Go over the years. Um, I gave a talk in 2015 here at DevConf <coughs> called Going the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Uh, at that time, the release of Go was Go 1.4. Um, so Go has proceeded on pretty pretty nice timeline of a six-month cadence. So Go 1.5, so on and so forth. Since then, in days, we're going to have Go 1.10 release. They just tagged the RC1 for Go 1.10 like last night. Um, and so from even like Go 1.9 to Go 1.10, there's almost 2,100 commits from that range. Uh, so very, very active project in that, in that sense, but it's still kind of neat that the, um, they have stuck to being a completely forward compatible language. Uh, meaning if you had written code for Go 1.0, it would still compile today. Like, like bar none, that's, that's, a, that's the guarantee that they, they give you. Um, which is interesting, uh, and if anybody has dealt, dealt with a version of project, project, it's not come without its pains because there have been plenty of times when they realize that was a poor decision to include that in Stidlib. Um, so some pieces like RPC, there's like a library within Stidlib that's an RPC package, and it is now considered to be frozen. Like, no fixes, please don't use it. We're not going to change it because somebody might be using it somewhere, but it was poor decision to include it in standard library. There's other RPCs like gRPC that are community projects. Go use them instead. Um, but you can always stay compiling on what it was before. Um, also for like API signatures and stuff like that, um, it'll, it'll always stay consistent. Um, so, we have one, two, three, four, five, and almost six releases since I last came and talked about Golang here. Um, it's kind of humorous because uh, Brad Fitzpatrick uh, is one of the core maintainers on Golang for Google. Uh, and <laughs> if, if any of you follow me on, on Twitter, 
at the first of every month, I always say happy, happy mailing list day because that's when everybody gets their mailman or major domo emails of, uh, of that. Oh, sure. Let's see how we do this. Um, let's see how we'll do this. Is that a... Um, anyhow, almost, almost as consistent, every single release in RC, Brad Fitzpatrick tweets that this, is, that this release is going to be the rest, best release ever. Um, and so far it's, it's been pretty consistent about that. Every release has gotten incrementally better. Um, WPAV. <laughs> Which is fun because this presentation is actually run from like a, a local server with a binary, so I'm copying like a whole directory and a binary over, and we're going to run it again. Uh, let's see. Do what? Yeah. <laughs> no PDF. Um, Seeing this, cool. Yeah. All right, uh, uh, media type of user. Mm -hmm. <coughs> oh, no, no, exact. <laughs> Wait, what do you, what is, how do I get the plus sign? Why does it have the... Um, thank you all for being so patient. Go <laughs> uh, All Yeah. Um, do you have go on here? No. Oh. Here, I'll, I'll, let me just try something else. Yeah. 
I'm, I, I'm trying to figure. I'm trying to figure out how, how to make a PDF. It's fine. Okay, we're going with this. Uh, uh, okay. Um, all right, so after a second, we have something workable. It looks terrible. Yeah, no, I need to start over. Okay, this is not. You joke, Ian, you joke. Thank you. Okay. So, nonetheless, release cadence. So, I'm, I'm, this, this is the time, uh, like the dates of those releases. They're, they're pretty predictable on a six month release. Um, the RC1 is out. They'll, it'll be out. It was expected by the end of the month. So, probably by next week, we'll have Go 110. Um, it's going to be the best release yet. Um, it, it's, it's, it, every single release has improved and not had major regressions upon every prior release. And that has been something substantial. Um, and it's so, at this point, reliable that each one is an improvement. Um, it led to the ability for them at some point to even um, rewrite the compiler, the, the core compiler itself from C into Go itself. Um, and so now any one of them can bootstrap a future version. Um, and unlike, and I'm not picking on Rust, but I've heard, the, the, I've heard it a few times within the Rust community that you, you, to bootstrap the latest one, you almost need the immediately prior one because they keep, add, they keep using features that were only added in the latest compiler. So to get to the latest, the bootstrap sequence requires you to like ladder step all the way up. Uh, whereas uh, in this compiler, the golden the golden child is Go 1.4. Uh, anything Go 1.4 and newer should be able to compile any of the latest <coughs> builds of, of Go. Um, so in no particular order, um, uh, a few of these are going to be talking points. Some of these I'm just going to breeze over, but like I just said, the, the, Go, the, the com core compiler itself is rewritten in Golang around 1.5. That was a major, major overhaul. Um, and some really, really fascinating work came out of that. Russ Cox uh, is a brilliant person, and um, I, I, I like a lot about what he does. And the project that he created that I would love to see people reuse in other ways is a semantic parser for languages. It is not specific to C at all, but it can, it, it, it basically has interfaces that you can semantically parse supposedly any language and be able to convert it to almost any other language. The things he was interested in was C to Go. Um, and I forget how many tens of thousands of lines of C the Go compiler was originally. And by the time he, they, they finally did the commit of the automated piece, there was only four instances that they had to go back and hand, hand fix some piece that was happening. And it was like a, a silly piece of like bitwise pointer shifting of pointers of pointers of pointers that was happening in the, in the compiler that it could not figure out how that would translate into another language. Fix this by hand. Um, really, really awesome piece of work. But that, that, that kind of effort and almost academic work uh, is just sitting there at this point bit rotting, but um, anyhow, because of that effort now, there's no more need to cross uh, to do any bootstrapping for cross compiles. Uh, in the prior days, you actually had, to, if you wanted to compile for Windows from Linux, you had to compile a boatload of stuff beforehand just to have the, co the cross compiler available. Now, straight out of the box, if you install Golang on a Raspberry Pi, 
you can set the environment variable go OS equals Windows and com compile some piece of code and you will get a Windows 64-bit or 32-bit .exe binary straight away. Um, and that is fantastic. Uh, they did add Dan Walsh, shared library support. <laughs> as far back as Go15, um, it does not have the maturity of C, C++ shared libraries that have been around for 15, 20 years now. Um, it allows some piece of the ABI for the version that it was compiled against to match, but if you have Go181 to Go182, you will need to recompile world. Um, that's, that's still kind of a, something that needs to happen. Uh, but if you had certain, within certain amounts, you can do recompiles of this, like, main shared objects and not have to recompile all the way down the chain. The biggest thing that this adds for uh, deployments is the fact that the binaries are so big now because, like, Kubernetes or OpenShift, for God's sake, is like a 300 meg binary. Um, if you have deployments that are homogenous and, and they're pieces that they're being used, like everything on this host was compiled, you know, in the system, the core system was uh, compiled with 191 or something like that, then you can uh, decrease your page caching. That's, that's probably the biggest use case because you're already going to like recompile world as necessary. But if you have a single 30 meg libstud so that's all the standard, standard library pieces, you don't need that same bit compiled into 15 different binaries, and each one of those binaries is loaded into page cache by the kernel. You could just have that one 30 meg binary loaded once, and then n number of other binaries. I mean, like, th this is old school piece, but it's, that's some of the optimization that shared, shared libraries have given us over time. Um, that's really the biggest optimization. It's less the recompiling everything uh, part of that. Um, so HTTP2 support is, it was first introduced in 1.6. Um, that has progressed and had a lot of features added since then. Um, vendoring, and I'll get into talking about part of why vendoring is, has helped Go solve some problems and has introduced a whole slew of other issues. If you're not familiar with it, I'll talk about it in a second. Um, single static, uh, static single assignment backend was, I, I don't have all the particulars on it. There's other folks that could go way, way into the more nitty gritty details of that. What the SSA did do is that it made the templating for adding new architectures uh, immensely easy. Um, so at this point, almost every single release, they're adding more and more new architectures, like uh, S390, Little Indian, Big Indian, and it's just like trickling on and on and on because it's almost like a template that you need to fill out and it can project the machine instructions for the, for the uh, assembly that will come out the other side. Um, also, the binaries did get a little bit more improved. Um, it, uh, also, I don't think I included it, but Go17, they did a lot of work on the garbage collection and for, for many people, the the, the runtime's garbage collection um, dropped for, for very, very large distributed apps, dropped to almost imperceivable level, in, imperceivable levels. Like, it, it's not even a, a blip on most, people, most people's metrics when garbage collection occurs. Um, so Go, Go has, to, some, to a large degree, the, the luxury of being a garbage collected language without taking the hit for any pauses. Um, context is now including Go. There was a external library for that. It was one of the few times that they wholesale had an external package that they brought into standard library um, just because it was a pattern that they were seeing so often and they wanted to be able to use it inside of the standard library as well. Um, so then in Go18, separate from shared libraries, they added plugins um, with, with mixed with mixed res, re, uh, response and performance. Plugins are a bit more of the trying to solve the DL open use case. So Golang, despite being com a compiled language and actually being able to link against C applications and C shared objects, has no ability to do DL open. It's, it's a multi-threaded, like, you're, you're, you're already in your own thread and the, the garbage collection's happening somewhere else to DL open. 
uh, it was tricky to hap have that happen safely. Um, so now they have this notion of plugins where you can write an application in such a way that it compiles to a shared object and then another application can like search and find those shared objects and try and load them and have a communication layer of like them registering themselves, what, what objects and you know, functions do they export? <coughs> Is this what I expect? Uh, in some ways, has anybody written or done much with gRPC? A couple of hands. So in gRPC, you will write almost like a template of the fields that you expect, the functions you might expect, like what, what is it, the service that you're interacting with, and if, it, if when you connect to another you know, endpoint, if it also responds to those things, then we know how to communicate. Um, it's a similar function that happens in the plugins. So far, there has been mixed response on how it actually handles um, memory state across that. Like, uh, if you write a plugin, where and how that ties back into the main garbage collection, how you handle uh, passing objects around there. Um, so it was like everybody got wildly excited, and you saw people start trying to adopt it and fit, you know, scratch the itch that they wanted by plugins, and then immediately stop again because they were like, this, this is a little sketchy. It might solve like some use cases, but not a wholesale feature. Uh, so if you are interested in that, proceed with caution. Uh, 1.9 was not really a splashy release, but it was largely, whole, largely improvements across the board. 1.10 has many features, and uh, I'm, sh I'm sure we'll hear a lot more about it when they write up a, f a formal blog. Of the pieces that I've been most in involved in and uh, watching is sparse file support for archive, archive tar. Um, so in the container space, uh, if you went into a container right now and there's been people have uh, proof of concepts for a denial of service or sh whatever, you, what all you want to call it, some people call it fishing with dynamite, um, that you could have a container or send a, a pair of instructions that would, tr you just truncate, truncate a one terabyte file. And so in, in Linux, that sets a file that uh, the inode and all the different pieces tell you the parameters of the file, but it doesn't actually allocate those on disk. So many things already support this natively. If you gzip that file, it would be like a few, a few bytes. If you made a tar archive with dash dash sparse files, uh, or dash dash sparse, it would be a few bytes. Um, on Docker and a number of other runtimes, as soon as you say commit this layer, it's actually not using anything GNU tar, it's using archive tar from standard library, and it allocates those bytes. So as soon as you commit that thing, um, somewhere on your disk and somewhere in memory, it's trying to run through one terabyte full of zeros. Um, if you push that layer, it would be a one terabyte thing. Um, it, it, it's very exciting. <laughs> um, so now, without breaking the API for existing tar, uh, archive tar, there's now a, a new and different way of trying to guess whether or just go ahead and try and treat something as a sparse file. Um, there's, it, it's, it'll be interesting to see how we, we, we implement it without taking too much of a performance hit of guessing whether a file is going to be uh, with holes in it. But uh, it, should, it should actually mitigate a number of issues and on the whole, be a good good thing. We'll see. Um, anyhow, so less than ideal. Uh, how many people have used or otherwise experienced Golang and had a bad time? Not that many. I mean, maybe they didn't come to the talk because <laughs> they had a bad time. Um, so package management is a beast in Golang. Um, and I, I put all, all three of these things up here. Uh, Jan, Jan actually gave a talk or a, in this room a few hours ago. And the, the, the conversation here, uh, the FPC, the Fedora packaging, or I don't, I don't even know what FPC stands for. Issue number 382 is one of the longest running open tickets there to try and figure out what to do with packaging guidelines for Go. We've, we've, we've got a draft up 
it's been open for honestly probably five years at this point. Um, and lots and lots and lots of comments and back and forth and otherwise. Uh, there has been times in the past with RPMs vendored or third, brought in third party, but most distributions, Debian, Fedora, otherwise, don't allow bringing third party libraries into the code that's compiled. Um, in Golang, that's in some way different because it's not like a runtime dependency. You can't split it up now and then have a runtime, like bring all the RPMs back in and assemble them at runtime. You have a source code piece and uh, it compiles and then you have a binary that's shipped with all those pieces in it already. Because uh, most of the time, everything is static. Um, just because we're not quite prepared for the, the rebuild effort that would be needed for Golang and shared objects. So due to that, all the, all the RPMs for those libraries are source only, they're like header only builds. And then we have loads and loads of exemptions or otherwise through like Fedora to, to allow third partying all the, all the different pieces are in there. And, and any given project might have chosen a particular commit because most of the packages that, or the, the libraries that are used are Git master at some point. Um, so version conflicts and otherwise, uh, it, it means that anytime that you pull in some RPM with a binary that's a Go binary, it's, it's vendored or third partied all of its dependencies. And it's, it's ugly. Um, and there's other reasons why it's ugly. <coughs> the community has worked uh, so I, I mentioned Golang Dep here. It's one of the vendoring tools that is now looking to consolidate how vendoring happens within the community uh, because Upstream did not want to solve this problem up front. They just thought everybody will always build off a of master because that's what they do at Google and that does not work for everybody. Uh, so the community went in about 15 different directions. There's, there's many, many tools to vendor your, your dependencies. Um, at this point, Upstream realizes it's a bad problem, and they're trying to bring it back together in Golang Dep. It's it's not a it's not it's a less than ideal problem. Um, the other piece that's less than ideal is debugging is still archaic. Um, it, it has not gotten I mean it has gotten better, but largely, if people are starting to debug Go, it's still f print uh, printfs, um, and it's still Adding, adding, like now people are getting into tracing and all kinds of other stuff that help, but ultimately people still use printfs in all kinds of places to try and step through where an issue is happening. Um, we have had calls with, with Google project managers. We have engaged them, uh, several different parts of the team, either from our product, product side to our tools team, GDB, otherwise, Google is, very, very open, and, and uh, this is a call to action for if any of you, this is your day job or your side interest, um, Google is more than willing to take and, and brainstorm features of what's needed and which dwarf symbols and how, how all to get that to work. Uh, this, cut, cut it off, but GDB is not their interest. They're not, they're not there's no use case within upstream that actually I won't say that they don't care about GDB. It's just they don't use it, and they're not going to spend the. Google is not has said they're not going to spend the money to fix GDB to do the type of green threading that is needed for how Google's uh, Golang's green threading works. Um, so it needs it needs to get better, and uh, we are making it better. But there we are. Other piece, Go is bypasses most of the crypto stack that is in uh, most distributions, Windows, Windows, Darwin, Linux, otherwise. Uh, it's great. Uh, Adam Langley does, does good work with all the crypto stack, but FIPS just doesn't exist. Um, so if you have any use cases that are wanting to be like FIPS 140-2 compliant, uh, and then they say, and we want to use Docker or OpenShift or Kubernetes, they are dead in the water. They're, they're, there's, there's, you just kind of have to hand wave like, uh, yeah, we don't use MD5 or, any, you know, like it, there's, no, there's nothing there. So 
immediately, the reasons that it's nice is that FIPS is now in progress. Uh, this made some splash within the community. Um, various, various companies wanted to get their name put onto this, but Google is actually footing the work. Um, the, the formidable piece is that Google is actually looking to get boring SSL FIPS certified. Um, so boring SSL for those who might have heard about it, but otherwise, they, they attempted to find the most minimal set of the C API from OpenSSL that is needed and trim away everything else so that the code path is as narrow and narrowly defined as possible so that you can um, embed it into Chrome, embed it into Android, and not have the full world of OpenSSL in there and literally make it boring. Um, so OpenSSL, many people have gotten it certified. Red Hat, is stand, you know, we, we have OpenSSL FIPS 140-2 certified. Google is doing that for boring SSL. And now Rust Cox Upstream is, has a branch to have um, Go, Go's crypto stack be able to switch over to using boring SSL when certain build flags are provided. Um, thankfully, we are, I don't see him in the room, but we have recently in the last six months hired on Derek Parker from CoreOS, who is the writer of Delve, the Delve debugger. Uh, so he's on our, our core tools team now. Um, and he, this is now under his pur purview, is that we are working in that space to either figure out how we could accommodate Boring SSL and or have that same type of infrastructure used to use our OpenSSL instead. Uh, so the FIPS 140-2 conversation with customers and otherwise uh, is, is a possibility. Likewise, uh, Derek, we have debugging traction. So one of Derek's other functions uh, that I'm super excited about, and it, he's, he's super excited about it also, is that he gets to spend more time on this pers personal project that is a Go debugger. Um, so that's obviously very exciting because at this point, uh, we have products now. <laughs> we have, Red Hat has products that are written in Golang and um, as customers are gonna be sending in like 40 gig core dumps, we need to be able to do something about that. Um, five minutes. Yeah, technical difficulties. So, um, lear learning the code, learning and owning the code is, I, I have now found to, to be much, much easier. Uh, as I've seen several teams either start a new project in Go or actually rewrite wholesale projects into Go. And yes, everybody hates change. It's a pain in the ass. I understand that. But many of those people, even while they legitimately find reasons that they still hate Go, it has made uh, for folks that have never written anything but Java or folks that have never written anything but Python uh, or even C have now been able to switch over almost within like two weeks and be able to start writing in an entirely new language and write code that others can also read and maintain. Um, and it can come back to six months later and be able to figure out what it does. There are not many languages that I have ever worked in where that's the, that's the case. Like if you had one person that was writing their own flavor of Ruby and you come back to it some other time and it looks like Perl, like you can't read it again. Um, or you, somebody who's never written C before gets written, thrown into a C project Six months later, they are still learning. Uh, they're writing code, but they are still learning, and the code that they have already written needs to be rewritten. Um, it's, it's been remarkable to see teams switching over to Go projects. MultiArch has gotten much, much easier and much, much better now, especially for all the different platforms that we support. Uh, we're able to bootstrap on ARC64 and S390 and otherwise. Um, even when the upstream Go compiler won't compile. As long as GCC compiles, you have GCC Go. Uh, and as of, as of the 7.2, GCC 7.2, it's, it's a very recent API of Go. Uh, so that's, that's been really nice. Um, there's some trend data. The community is actually, I, I like it a lot. They're very vigilantly diverse, like actively defending anything that would make it an unsafe or not nice community. So if you want to get involved in the upstream, it is a great community. And I, I, I 
am very glad to see how it's, it has grown over time. Um, right now, actively, like today, there are four CFPs open for different talk, talk conferences that, that are Go related. Um, I, uh, GopherCon is in Denver. GopherCon.is is in Iceland. That one's in June. Uh, the talk, the, the CFP is open until March. Uh, GopherCon Singapore is, the, the CFP is open until the end of February. Uh, I don't remember when that conference is going on. And then Gotham Go is like in April sometime. Uh, so if you are active in this community uh, and are looking for places to either hear talks or submit talks, please get involved. Where's Red Hat? So we're almost time for, for wrap up and questions. But where, where are we in this space? Um, so despite actually being very involved in projects that are using Go and now at this point actually having products that are written in Go uh, and wholesale teams that that's all they are involved in, either from the, the support and tooling side to writing and upstream work and otherwise, uh, we are not quite sponsoring events. So you go to these GopherCon events and you're going to see CoreOS, you're going to see Ubuntu, uh, you're going to see any other, other number of names that are our competitors. We are not in this space yet. Um, it's something that bothers me and I want to fix. Uh, if you, I, I want to see more people submitting talks to these spaces. Uh, we already are very respected. So you go talk to any one of these companies, Google and otherwise, about Red Hat's work, especially like Kubernetes. They are hands down ex like respectful of the work and the contributions and what we produce in this area and we are non-existent in a lot of like the communications and the like sponsorships and otherwise, and I want that to get better. Um, yeah, anyhow, so I've already said it a few times, but we, we're, we're becoming more and more present in this space while at the same time not being present in this space, and I want that to change. Um, so my talks are up on GitHub, and we are ready for questions. I kind of blazed through that last part. Sorry for the technical difficulties. What kind of questions can I answer for you? I've, I've, I've allowed like five, five or ten minutes for questions. Uh, shoot. Yes? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, that's true. Um, so right here, that, uh, I, 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 I put these down because I, they were the fresh on my mind of open, open uh, CFPs right now. But yeah, dot .go, the question was just uh, a missed one. Dot .go has a series where they, they do like dot .js and a few other ones, and it's in a wonderful venue. But dot .go is in Paris in like the fall? Is it like October-ish or something like this? And it's, it's in like a, a wonderful like theater with like velvet curtains. It's a fantastic venue. Um, so yeah, there, there's, there's that, that conference as well. Yes? Have you looked at the LLVM for example, Go? LLVM for Go? Yeah, for Not at all. Interesting. Do you know who's behind it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it should be pretty easy. So the, it, the, the statement was around LLVM for Go. There, there had been one effort that was now deserted, and there's now um, something new and active for, for LLVM. Um, it shouldn't, it honestly should not be that hard. Again, yeah, Ian Lance Taylor, who's an old, old name in all the things, really. Um, he, he wrote the gold linker. Uh, all, I mean, like, he's, he's archaic name and wonderful. Um, he wrote the front end for GCC, and he wrote it in such a way that there's a translation layer, uh, basically uses all the standard library to parse, uh, and then can translate to anything else. So it'd be really interesting if, if uh, to see more compiler pieces like that, especially with what LLVM can handle. Cool. What else? Yes? What is the goal on the one uh, person who
Um, the, there are, I, I, don't, I don't know the specifics to your question. So the question was, what, what happened to make the binaries about 20 to 30% smaller? Um, the, I was about to say, uh, That's, like, I'm not 100% sure. that's, that, so, so around that same time, Austin Clements, um, I don't know who he works for, has, had been doing lots of work to figure out and make better all the dwarf symbols, kind of to cl not I mean, overall to help it be more debuggable, but mostly to clean up some of the nonsense that it produced in the compiler. Um, and there was a lot of redundancy and nastiness. So there was a huge effort in just cleaning up the, the code that was produced and like how the ELF tables were written around the same time that the SSA had been going on. And SSA was like in a dev branch for a release or two. Um, they both hit around the same time. I do think SSA had a lot to do with it, um, but there were other efforts in just general cleanup of the exported code, the maps that were built for, for mapping around uh, with it, like all the different instructions. Um, I think it was a number of things, and it was just a good release. Like they hit at the same time, and it made it 20 to 30% better. So maybe one or two more questions. One, two more questions. <coughs> all right. Well, I'll, I'll give you back three or four minutes. Uh, thank you all for coming to the talk. Hit me up if you have any other questions about Golang. <laughs>